The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon from Chicago and the Parliament of the World's Religions. My name is Molly Horan and I'll be co-moderating today's discussion, Listen Still Unlearned, How Bystanders Support Hate and Violence. Welcome to everyone with us today and a very warm welcome to our presenter Beth Lilac from the Holocaust Memorial Museum and Tolerance Center of Nassau County. Beth Lilac is the Senior Director of Education and Community Affairs at the Holocaust Memorial Museum and Tolerance Center. She is a member of the Nassau County Task Force on Bias Crimes and serves on the advisory board for the Nassau County Commission on Human Rights. Beth is also a member of the International Association of Genocide Scholars, National Women's Studies Association, and African Studies Association. In addition to Holocaust history, Beth's research areas include eugenics, medical experimentation and ethics, German imperialism and genocide in Africa, women's histories, and historical and current slavery. We are so grateful to Beth for sharing this time with us today. It is especially important now with the rise of hate news we have learned over the holy season of Easter and Passover for Christians and the Jewish community that we become informed. In a little more than a week, we have been horrified by the news of three persons killed by a white supremacist at Jewish community center sites in Overland Park, Kansas. The Parliament immediately reached out to the interfaith community there and joined with United Religions Initiative to issue what we called a love alert, encouraging the global interfaith community to rise in support with messages of love. Our words and prayers actually did reach one of the families victimized by the attack, and we have learned that is so important, but it isn't enough. The Southern Poverty Law Center revealed uh, in the last week, the results of their hate watch telling us that at least 100 crime murders uh, stemming from hate came from the leading online community for hate supremacists called Stormfront, and that's only in the last five years. Um, this includes last week's shooting at the Jewish community centers in Kansas and the Oak Creek, Wisconsin shootings, which killed six six at the Gurdwara there. Uh, they are our friends, and this cannot continue. So we will not be bystanders. Uh, we hope that the communities in Ukraine will not allow whatever the military authorities are trying to do to the Jewish community there by being bystanders either. This presentation will help illuminate some basic lessons about what hate crime is and what our relationship is to it. Beth is graciously sharing her time with the Parliament again. We had the honor of witnessing this presentation last summer at our pilot Fates Against Hate Day of Learning in Long Island, and it has been our burning wish to share it through webinars since. So for those who have joined today, we do thank you and hope to get to know you better in our question and answer discussion after Beth's talk. We welcome Beth and we thank her. Um, Beth has also graciously said she will uh, answer any questions that you have during her presentation. So please don't hesitate to raise your hand or send questions my way. So uh, Beth, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly. And it, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be part of your webinar series. And thank you so much for the invitation. Not a problem. We're very honored to have you. Um, I'm gone ahead and made you the presenter, so now we can see your screen. Um, so, so thanks so much, and I look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay. And to everybody out there that's listening, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This is the first time I've conducted a webinar, so um, hopefully I will do a decent job. And again, I'm very willing to take any questions during the presentation don't hesitate to ask. Um, so we are going to look at how bystanders support hatred, hate crimes, violence in our communities around the world, and what we can do to intervene and pre uh, prevent. And one of the, excuse me for that, and I'm go we're also going to focus in on the Holocaust, among other genocides, as a case study. This was an extreme form of a hate crime, and it's, there's a lot of lessons embedded within this particular history to give us tools to move forward in a more positive way and to help build community. So that we're all starting on the same page, um, I thought it was important to put up a definition of a hate crime uh, that was enacted by Congress with the Hate Crime Statistics Act, which you will see at the bottom. Uh, and basically, it's a criminal offense against a person or property motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias against a race, religion, disability, ethnicity, origin, um, or sexual orientation. And what's very interesting about this, and as the FBI quote right above it, is the hate crime is just a regular crime.
crime that we're all familiar with, whether it's murder, arson, um, uh, vandalism, but there's that extra element of how that perpetrator is feeling, how that perpetrator perceives the victim that this crime is perpetrated on. So it, it's, it's a very complicated issue, even though at times it seems very clear cut as to what a hate crime is. Just to give um, a very easy visual, because we're protected by free, free speech, excuse me, uh, people like KKK members, neo-Nazis, any hate group can collect together, can be out in the public, and can demonstrate, whether that means a, a parade, having some type of a protest. They do have that right to, you know, to verbalize their hatred. When it becomes a crime is when they take action upon that, um, whether it's something like vandalism. And then, of course, more recently, we had the shooting in Kansas. Um, and even though the victims um, were not Jewish, his intended victims were Jewish, this was definitely a hate crime by all definitions. So looking at the Holocaust as an extended and very extensive hate crime, it's important whether this happened in Nazi Germany and then eventually throughout Nazi Europe, this happened over a number of years of an escalation of intolerance and the acceptance by people in Germany, in Europe, and around the world for allowing this to happen. And it's the same here in our country. It was the same during the Rwandan genocide, the genocide in Bosnia against Muslims. Wherever this is happening, it's not only perpetrated by people, but it is allowed to happen by the bystanders. And bystanders always outnumber the perpetrators. Now, whether from the very my, most minor type of an incident of intolerance, uh, you could look at bullying at school, in the schoolyard. There's always people around, there's always kids around and teachers that see what happens, and very, very rarely does anyone ever take any type of action. And again, people witnessing this are greatly in the majority compared to the victims or compared to the perpetrators. And then on the other side, the very the most extreme form is, of course, genocide. Um, when people hear the term Holocaust, they assume that it only applied to Jews or it's only a Jewish event or only Jews should be interested in it. When you look at the numbers, it really turns that perspective on its head. Jews, they were absolutely the number one target, and six million of them were murdered. However, if you add in the perpetrators, the perpetrators were not Jews. The bystanders in Europe, around the world, were not Jews. Collaborators were not Jews. Rescuers were not Jews. There were other victims that were not Jews. So there were so many more other people involved, and that's why the Holocaust is such a useful example to take a look at an escalation of intolerance and the fact that with stereotyping and scapegoating, how this can lead, because it's unchecked, all the way to mass murder. And there is a gentleman by the name of Gregory Stanton, who worked for the State Department, who has outlined very clearly the stages of genocide and what leads up to it, because no genocide just occurs overnight without um, any type of context. There's no such thing as a genocide happening from a vacuum. There are always months, years, decades of something building up to allow this to happen. Um, oh, just to go back to the slide again, I apologize. Um, so the, the photo down there with the um, Berlin Olympics, this is in 36. You can just see a fraction of the number of supporters and they're doing the Heil Hitler salute. This is three years after Hitler has been in power. It is one year after the citizenship was taken away from all German Jews, German blacks, and Germa, Roma, and Sinti, more commonly known as gypsies. So already people had lost citizenship. Um, it was three years after people, uh, socialists, communists, Jews, gays, um, other, quote, non-Aryans were imprisoned in concentration camps. And yet we have the Olympics 
being celebrated and attended by millions. How much did they know? There was also some propaganda by the Nazis where they, um, you know, took down some of the swastika flags. They tried to hide some of the more violent um, actions in Berlin. But horrific things were still going on uh, throughout Germany and, uh, excuse me, throughout Germany. Um, a very profound quote was made by the Supreme Court of Canada when they were discussing their own anti-hate legislation. And that is that the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers, it began with words. And this is just so crucial uh, because it applies, again, to all aspects of this scope of intolerance and hatred, whether it's in you know, the schoolyard, the workplace, society, uh, with hate crimes, or going to genocide. The, the picture that you're looking at is a mass rally held in uh, Nuremberg, and the banners read, as I uh, translated it, the Jews are our misfortune. Gas chambers, mass murder were not enacted immediately upon the Nazis coming to power. This took a lot of time of different steps. And with each step, the Nazis realized nobody's intervening. Nobody cares about the victims. We can do anything we want. These are just a couple of examples of how the um, advertising for hatred was spread through Germany and then eventually to other countries. Um, race shame. Um, on the left there in the dark figure with the big nose is supposed to be the stereotypical Jewish male and taking advantage, raping the young white Aryan woman. Other examples, there was a lot of anti-black sentiment and there was persecution against black Germans uh, during this time. And also against people with disabilities. And the first mass murder of anybody by the Nazis was against a group of 5,000 babies with disabilities. And this was um, perpetrated right before World War II began. By the end of the war in 1945, anywhere between 200 and 275,000, possibly even more um, children, adults were murdered that had some form of a disability. And the type of propaganda that the Nazis uh, took part of, so did perpetrators of other genocides. These are examples from the Rwandan genocide. Before the actual murders began, um, the Hutus, which were the perpetrator group, via the radio spread vicious, vicious propaganda. And part of their message was that the Tutsis were cockroaches. So what do you want to do with a cockroach, vermin, an insect? You need to kill it. You need to exterminate it. And the hatred that was espoused through radio uh, propaganda was just absolutely um, intense. The other photo, again, with any genocide, there's always sexualized violence, mass rape. And here we have um, a character of General Dallier, and I'll tell you who he is in just a second, with uh, women that are supposed to represent the Tutsi women and how they are taking advantage and collaborating and cohorting with Dallier. Dallier happened to be the commander, the general of the United Nations peacekeeping forces in Rwanda. As the stages, as things were beginning to get very hot in Rwanda and he realized genocide was about to incite, he begged the United Nations for support. He asked for more peacekeeping forces. He needed extra manpower, women power on the ground to help prevent genocide. Not only what did the UN deny him of any extra forces, but they actually took away a lot of the troops that he had in Rwanda. So he was left um, fairly helpless to pre in, uh, preventing the genocide that he saw unfold before him. Um, it was very well known that he was trying to do everything he could to prevent the genocide, and so the, Huts the Hutus, you know, took this and uh, considered him an enemy and um, thus portrayed him in, in such a, a character. Albert Einstein, excuse me, 
among his other many accomplishments, has really um, targeted one of the most important lessons that we have learned, not just from the Holocaust, but from any act of hatred. And that is that it's not so much the perpetrators who are really the danger, but it's us. It's the people that are witnessing it and who refuse to take action, who refuse to, who, uh, who remain silent. When you do not take action, when you remain silent during any form of hatred or intolerance, injustice, you are not neutral. There is no such thing as neutral in this type of an event. You are helping, supporting the perpetrator because you are keeping silent. That is assisting the crime that's taking place. And whether it's bullying, whether it's actual mass murder, you are helping the perpetrator. By taking action effectively and safely, you are then coming to the aid of the victim. There's no way just to stay in the middle, witness what is happening, and not do anything. There's no such thing as neutrality when it comes to genocide or bullying or intolerance. If you witness it, you are a key participant, and it's your choice what you choose to do with that uh, knowledge and that action, that event that you're witnessing. So let's take a look at who chose to be a bystander. Nobody had a gun to their head. There's you know, no such thing as um, brainwashing during the Holocaust or any genocide or hate crime. This is by choice. People, there is propaganda. People are indoctrinated. They believe advertisements and media, but it still comes down to choice. And all sorts of people choose to be a bystander, to support the perpetrator. Um, not only are we looking at a group of stormtroopers or SA, but different forms of Nazi police, but you can see uh, all of the just regular civilians standing by and watching. In Poland, the important people to focus on here, the bystanders, are not the people in uniform, but the surrounding civilians. And the looks on their faces, the entertainment that they are feeling from watching a Jewish person be humiliated and physically traumatized. And we have similar going on in Manhattan in terms of bystanders, in terms of Nazi supporters. And this is a parade in Manhattan in the 1930s in support of Nazism. And again, they are covered by free speech to um, conduct this parade. These photos were taken at relatively the same year in the late 1930s. And it's really a testament to how we allow hate crimes um, to exist and to uh, truly flourish. And one of the questions I get asked a lot at our Holocaust Center is, you know, why didn't we as Americans, why didn't we intervene? You know, we're supposed to be the heroes, the good guys. When things were starting to go very bad for people in Germany, why didn't we do something? And the answer are these two photos. The, obviously, this is a photo from the Jim Crow era down south with the uh, segregated water fountains. And on the right hand is a Jewish woman sitting on a bench marked for Jews only. And she's hiding her face. She didn't want her picture taken. Uh, she's humiliated. Down the pathway in the park, there's another bench marked for Aryans only. And so segregation was um, as strong and as institutionalized in Nazi Germany and in Nazi Austria as it was in the United States at the same time period. And for a while in the 1930s, what was happening in our country, in most parts of our country, were very similar to what was happening in Nazi Germany and in Austria in terms of segre segre uh, segre uh, segregation, excuse me, in terms of anti-miscegenation laws, who could marry whom. Um, here in this country, it was illegal until 1967 for blacks and whites to marry in the South. In other parts of our country, it was illegal for uh, white Americans to marry um, indigenous Alaskans or Chinese or indigenous Hawaiians. And you know, similarly, during the Nazi era, Aryans could not marry a non-Aryan. So 
when you have this institutionalized, meaning when it's sanctioned by our legislators with laws, society is supporting this in many different ways. And of course, this nurtures hatred, this nurtures hate crimes. We are saying it is okay to be intolerant, it is okay to hate other people and then to act viciously upon them, such as with uh, the people that are depicted in this, in these photos. Um, not too far apart chronologically on different sides of the world uh, geographically and yet they look the same. If I didn't have the cities and countries listed here, it could almost be, you wouldn't know if it was America or in Poland during the Nazi time. There was um, a turning point in history in 1938 that has become known as the Evian Conference. And it's, very, it's a very important turning point that almost nobody knows about. And this was really the fork in the road where we as a world society could have made the right choice. And unfortunately, we didn't. Um, under a lot of pressure, President Roosevelt convened 32 nations, 31 other nations, including the United States, to a conference in Evian, France. And the only uh, discussion topic, really, the main agenda topic was, you know, loosening up the quota system, allowing Jewish immigrants, refugees to come into this country to escape Nazi Germany. And out of all these 32 nations, there was only one nation that stood up and said that they would loosen their doors and allow Jews to enter. And if I had you live in front of me, I would ask, you know, which country do you think it was out of all these countries that you see before you? Unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. Uh, the only country that stood up and made the moral choice was the Dominican Republic. And I ask you the next time you look at a map, a global map, try and find the Dominican Republic. It's this tiny little island, and out of all these great nations, the United States, Switzerland, Australia, Great Britain, they were the only ones that said that they would accept some Jews. Uh, you can see some of the quotes by some of the delegates that, it, that attended that just give testament to some of the racist issues that they were expressing. Uh, but basically, the doors were closed, and this gave a green light to Hitler and the Nazis. This was a, uh, this, this conference screamed out, we don't care about the Jews, we don't want them, they're not our problem. And Hitler at that point realized we can do anything we want. And a few months later, what most of, uh, what, what many people um, have heard about is Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass. And that was unleashed upon Jews in, not, uh, in Germany and Austria, knowing, in parts of Czechoslovakia, knowing that nobody would intervene. Looking at our own history as America, when, as Americans, when we had the chance to open up our gates right before World War II began, and accept um, approximately 900 Jews into our country who had legal papers. As you can see, they started out in Germany. They had legal visas to enter Cuba. Uh, when they got there, Cuba refused them entry. They only allowed the non-Jews to disembark. And so the captain did not want to take them back to Germany. Not that mass murder had begun at this point, but he knew the concentration camps. He knew what awaited them. And so he begged the United States, he begged Roosevelt, please, let these 900 people off. Let them enter America. And people in Miami saw the ship sailing back and forth, waiting for a positive answer from Roosevelt. And of course, none came. So the captain was forced to return to Europe. Uh, 200 people were allowed to disembark in England, and they were rescued. The rest of them were, most of them were eventually um, caught up in the Nazi net and were sent to concentration camps and murdered. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, where is that line? When do you cross the line from being a bystander to an actual collaborator? The issue of immigration is still very much, anti-immigration is still very much alive and well in this country. Um, I don't know where you all are located because uh, I can't see you and ask you, but here on Long Island in New York, 
we have a lot of problems right in our own backyard. The reason that the Jews were not allowed to enter, or some of the reasons that the Jews were not allowed to enter during the 1930s into America was because they were, um, they, the, uh, the propaganda was that the, the government did not want them to become burdens on society. Uh, people were afraid that they were criminals, that they would take away jobs of Americans, that the men would molest American women. Um, everything that you hear today against immigrants has been said against the Jews during that time, but also against other immigrants that have come in diff different times of history. It was the same against the Irish. It was the same against the Italians. It's just the same rhetoric that's used against immigrants regardless of what time period. And that said, we have to remember who the real illegal immigrants are and were and who the first ones were. Um, and unless you are a Native American or of American Indian descent, then we all come from illegal immigrants. Uh, because the um, pilgrims, the Europeans, did not have permission to land here. And so we really need to remember, even though this is kind of a funny um, cartoon, it really isn't funny. And we need to put this whole immigration discussion in context of reality and the reality of the history as Americans. Because there is so much anti-immigration sentiment, and because I just showed you the slide about the first illegal immigrants, I want to show you now a slide of legal immigrants that came to this country. And this was under a specific immigration mission enacted by the United States government, and it was called Operation Paperclip. And everybody that you see smiling into the camera are Nazis, and these are scientists. And all of these men were brought over by the government to work on um, our, to work within our military system. Many of these uh, men eventually worked on uh, the early days of NASA and the space program. But we brought these guys over, some of them before the war actually ended, and then there, was, then there were a lot of them were brought over uh, immediately after the war. Question that comes up is, you know, how much did the United States know? When did they know it? Um, we, if we don't know that something is happening, how can we be uh, blamed for not taking action? And the truth is that with the media system today, and even though we didn't have the internet or cell phones back in the 40s, there were still newspapers. Uh, people went to the movies. They could have seen uh, footage there. But this was reported, not always on the front page, Sometimes it was on the back page or in a small little corner, but small news stories were filtering out. Definitely the, the elite in the American government as well as the British government knew what was happening um, with the buildup of um, crimes into mass murder. And if you can read the quote by Roosevelt on the right-hand side, you know, it's just very interesting to, uh, to take a look at that and ask where that kindness really was. Um, in 1942, he received, the government received very, very detailed reports from our embassy in Geneva about what was happening throughout Europe. By this time in 1942, mass murder was uh, fully launched. The uh, death camps were starting, were, were really um, murdering millions of people. In 1943, Roosevelt personally met with a Polish Catholic resistance leader who managed to escape from Poland, went to England to tell uh, the uh, government over there what was happening, asking for help. He came over to America, met with Roosevelt, begged him for help, brought messages from uh, Jewish resistance leaders, and the response was nothing. The response was silence. On the other hand, there are people who do demonstrate human kindness. And when it's, all, when it's during genocide, it's not just kindness, but it really is 
extraordinary, extraordinary courage on their part. And these are just ordinary people. Uh, you don't have to be Superman or Superwoman to commit an act of kindness or to help somebody else. These are just two examples. The one of the couple on the left were rescuers uh, during the Rwandan genocide. And there's a quote by a woman that was rescued during the Rwandan genocide um, by another family. On the right-hand side, a few years ago, we had a program with Albanian Muslim rescuers during the Holocaust. And the gentleman at the podium is the son of a family that rescued. Um, he was a very young child and remembers the Jews in, in his home. And what's very interesting about Albania, Albania has some parallels with Denmark. Denmark really banded together to help rescue their Jewish community. And they were successful in rescuing about 95% of the Jews in their country. Albania went even kind of a step further. And they not only rescued 100% of their Jews, but they also rescued um, possibly a few thousand Jews from outlying areas, from Yugoslavia, from different countries that heard about what was happening in Albania and rushed to find refuge in this small country. Albania was the only Muslim country in Europe. The Albanians had a, they have a cultural code of basically being a good guest. It is very basic, and yet they take that to the extreme. So because somebody was in trouble, and in this case, in the 1940s, it was Jews, Albanians opened up their homes, opened up their country. And people found safety there. And those people would have risked their own, I mean, they did risk their own lives to rescue these people. It's an absolutely fascinating history of Albania. And I'm glad that I can um, share that with all of you. In this country, we have had a few incidents where we've seen communities band together to fight injustice, to fight hate crimes. Uh, probably the most famous was what happened in uh, Billings, Montana. And there's been films made about this called Modern Our Town, where Jews in the community were, uh, their homes were vandalized. They were attacked during the holiday of Hanukkah in December. And the entire town came together to support these Jews. Um, there were also hate crimes against other groups of people in Billings. American Indians, gays, and again, the entire town came together and supported each other. And they made a huge statement. This, this is not allowed. We will not put up with this kind of hatred. It is possible. Um, it's just that this kind of a story isn't on the 6 o'clock news generally. It's not on CNN. It's not in the New York Times. It's not on Facebook and Twitter. It's mainly the, the ugly sides of humanity. Um, so we need to focus more on the good that people are doing to show examples, to show role models, to show that it is possible for either one person to make a difference or for an entire t community to make a difference. And we need to teach that in our schools. We need to teach that to each other, that it's possible and how it can be done, and it's by supporting each other. Um, recently. Last year, we had this woman that's pictured there, Pamela Geller, whose uh, her claim to fame is being a rabid Islamophobe. She was invited by some Jewish temples to speak. And immediately, our center, as well as the Islamic Center on Long Island, as well as many different churches and temples and uh, Sikh temples, cultural and community lead leaders banded together immediately to show not only um, in protest, which what we did wasn't so much a protest against her, but it was more support for Muslims in our community and letting them know that they were not alone and that this woman, Pamela Geller, did not represent Americans. She did not represent Jews. Uh, she represented herself and other hate-filled people. But we showed that there was more support individually and, and institutionally um, for acceptance and respect and tolerance than there were for the people that went to see her and support her. 
These are headlines taken from local New York papers. Um, we still have so far to go in terms of what we need to learn. And those are a few titles just from the few months of 2014. A couple of statistics about the increase in certain hate crimes. One of the things to remember with any statistic is that you are only looking at numbers that have been reported. And more often than not, hate crimes, especially by certain victims of certain groups, will not report the violence that has been done to them. Uh, one group in particular are immigrants that are, do not have documents. They are very, very scared of going to any type of authority, let alone the police or the FBI, to tell them what happened. So they are a very easy target by many hate groups. So when you see statistics, always keep in mind that these are only the reported, only what the police are reporting. So it's much lower than the reality of what's happening. And I also want us to remember what happened uh, a few years ago with the Sikh temple. I know that Molly brought that up in her introduction. The photo on the right, for those of you that are not from the, the New York area, uh, is the mother of a gentleman named Marcelo Lucero holding a picture of her son. And in 2008, right here on Long Island, uh, he was walking with a friend and a group of teenagers from a local high school who would go out at least once a week uh, looking for immigrants to beat up. Uh, this was their entertainment. They, uh, this is how they, uh, this is how they used their free time at nighttime. This was their fun. Um, they went out and they ended up assaulting Marcelo Lucero and his friend, and one of the teens stabbed Marcelo fatally stabbed him and he was murdered. This was a huge incident on Long Island. Uh, and again, this did not happen overnight. This partly was caused by the atmosphere in the county, atmosphere uh, within, the, uh, within the government in Suffolk County, how people view immigrants. There were a lot of different factors that kind of supported this type of anti-immigrant feeling. The response to this was also overwhelming in terms of the protest, in terms of the anger over what happened. Southern, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center and Department of Justice came up here, uh, conducted investigations, wrote reports, you know, all very horrific. Um, and really exposing the ugliness of what was happening and forcing people to take a look at what was happening in their own backyard to take a look at the hatred and what this has led to. And that's one of the positive issues that has come out from the murder of Mr. Lucero is that it really did force, because we received national attention, it forced people to take a look at what was happening. Uh, we had a program here with his brother about a year ago, um, and it was just very interesting. They've made a documentary, a multi-perspective documentary on the murder of, this, of Marcelo. And it includes interviews with parents of the perpetrators and with school, uh, school friends of them. And it's just very interesting to hear many different sides of these people uh, trying to portray them in, in a certain way. So I encourage you to see the documentary. It's called Deputized. And I'd be happy to share information as to how you can get a copy of that if you're interested. I also want to remind everybody that we still, as you're hearing my voice, we are still witnessing genocides happening all over this world today. We, this map comes from Genocide Watch. The countries that are colored in red are where genocide is happening right now. And again, this doesn't always reach mainstream news. Um, you know, so we are aware, I've now made you aware of what is happening in the world and where genocide is ha taking place right now. And I'm going to ask you, you know, what are you going to do about it? And it's so easy today to do something, to at least use your voice. Don't remain silent. You can go on this website, genocidewatch.org, 
there are so many great genocide prevention, genocide intervention websites. You can do something. You are not helpless. And with the internet today, it doesn't cost you any money. It takes about one second to click a button to take action and send your opinion, send your voice to Washington, to the UN, to British Parliament, to whoever. Um, but you don't have to remain silent. If I'm the only one voicing my concern, voicing my protest, nothing's going to happen. If everybody listening, something, maybe a little bit, but if everybody listening plus one of their friends, and if one of their friends got one of their friends to also take action, you know, it's, it's just very true, that ripple effect. The more people that are concerned about something and raise their voice, then the people with the power will take notice and will make a change. In 1984, the then Speaker of the National Assembly of Namibia made an absolutely profound uh, statement that very, very few people um, think about. And Namibia, before it became the sovereign state of Namibia, used to be called Herero Land. And the indigenous people living there were called Herero. Between 1904 and 1908, a genocide was committed against these people and over 80% of the population was murdered by German colonial forces and the mil German military. This was the first genocide of the 20th century, about 10 years before, uh, 10 years or so uh, before the Armenian Genocide. And as you can see in the quote, what Mr. Gururov is saying is that we need, someone needs to set a precedent. If they had stopped the genocide of the Herero, you know, in, instead of this mad scramble with Africa to uh, steal the resources at the cost of, of the indigenous people, if there had been some type of intervention, the Herero genocide would have been stopped, would have been prevented. That would have set the precedent. And to this day, we have never set a precedent against genocide. We will go in after the fact. We will set uh, set up refugee camps. We will raise money for humanitarian aid for the refugees. But we don't go in and intervene when it's happening. And we certainly and unfortunately don't take action during those stages leading up to it. And that's what we really need to focus on is there are always red flags. We need to recognize those red flags and then we need to act upon them. And I am uh, getting to the end of the, the presentation, so I will walk with some questions. Uh, so many of the wars are fought over religion. Religion is used as an excuse of genocide, and I just want to be very clear that war and genocide are two separate entities altogether. And it does nobody any justice, especially the victims, if you label a genocide a conflict or civil war. The Rwandan genocide has been referred to as civil war. It was not. It was genocide. Uh, the um, Bosnian uh, genocide against the Muslims has been referred to as ethnic cleansing. There was nothing cleansing about that. It was mass murder, so we need to be careful. But so, so many times religion is used as this so-called um, excuse or reason. And what I have in front of you now is just a very simple list of some, not all, but some of the world's religions with a statement from their, you know, one of the main tenets of the religion. And I ask you just to take a look and try and match up which statement goes with which religion. And you'll find that it's impossible to do because they're basically all the same. And it's just to remind us, and I'm just using uh, religion here as one example, that we have so much more in common than differences. And whatever differences we do have just enrich us as a world society, as a, as a human population. And the last slide I have for you is a quote by the police chief from Billings, Montana, from Not In Our Time. And he's just very simply uh, stating that it's really not a police problem. It's community. And the community has to act together against it or 
they're allowing it as a community to exist. And we have to decide for ourselves what kind of a community do we want to live in. Do we want to live in a place like Billings? Do we want to live in a place that says, no, we will not put up with this? Or do we want to allow intolerance and hatred to flourish? So I thank you so much for your, your time and your patience. And I hope that you have found this time useful. And I welcome a discussion. Well, thank you, Beth. This is Molly back here at the Parliament. I. You know, this is the second time I've seen this presentation, this time with a lot more focus because I'm not also um, trying to coordinate an event, but I'm just so, um, I'm moved by the way that you've been able to sort of weave the relationship of genocide and hate crime and hate thought and political inaction and the linguistic side of it. It's just it's a really powerful presentation that I think encapsulates so much of what we're trying to convey. Um, and also, you know, to be uh, able to bring up the idea of compassion and, and the role that we all play is so important when we gather. Um, so I just want to begin by saying thank you. Um, and just maybe start a little bit of the conversation. We have a little bit of time here, about 10 minutes together. Um, so I fully sign up for not being a bystander. Uh, I do not want to uh, read these headlines and be inactive. And yes, in my, of course, my professional role coordinating um, an anti-hate campaign for an interfaith organization, uh, I'm very engaged. But what beyond that in my personal life, like what kind of practical steps should I take um, if I'm in an environment where I feel that there's some, some sort of bigoted speech or hate speech that's, you know, say at a party and um, nobody's saying anything, what, what would you suggest that I do? Um, first of all, thank you so much for your, for your very kind words. And I don't know if I can speak while you you're speaking just to say thank you, or if it's a, a one person at a time. So I, I apologize. No, we're both we're both uh, able to converse. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so in a social situation like that, definitely saying something. You know, again, taking into consideration your personal safety first. If someone obviously seems or is getting violent, then you know, confrontation isn't going to be the best way to handle it. But if it's um, kind of a friendly type of setting. You know, making the person aware of what they said and how you interpreted that sometimes can be enough. Sometimes people don't realize what they're saying or how they're saying it. Sometimes they do. And then the next step is to try and have a discussion with them, um, to educate them, to explain to them what is so offensive about that. And, and hopefully people around you, that you won't be there by yourself. Um, the more people, the more support you have, the better. You also have to be very aware that if you get into a discussion with someone where they, you can tell that they are not willing to open up their minds at all, then you, know, you don't want to smash your head against a brick wall and there are just some people that are very difficult to reach. Uh, but always confronting when it's safe to do so is very important because, again, the worst thing we can do is just remain silent and walk away. And at least for the, oh, I'm sorry. At least for that person, um, you might not make a dent with them that you don't um, support what they're saying. But for the bystanders, for anybody that's within listening distance, even if you end up walking away in frustration, they've at least heard you in opposition. They at least know that somebody cared. They might not have the wherewithal to say something, but you have become a role model for them. And maybe the next time they witness something, they'll have the courage to step forward and say something. Oh, thank you. I, I'm glad that you bring up um, the issue of safety because I think for many of us, we do want to say something, but we may, may feel that our um, sort of counter argument isn't strong enough or we don't feel brave enough to say something or we're afraid to incite someone's anger. Um, and so bravery and confidence, I think, are big pieces of that. Um, and just confidence in that, you know, you're standing on the right side um, to care about other people. Right, and that confidence is something that um, is, is just a matter of practice. I mean, I believe that we should be taught these kind of lessons in school very directly. We, we practice math problems. We practice multiplication tables. 
so that we can you know, access that information very easily, very quickly without thinking. Nobody is really taught how to stand up for somebody else. And it is, it's very difficult. And sometimes even if you have the, um, the willingness to do so, you don't always know what to do or what to do safely. And we need to give those very basic, very clear lessons, not only to kids, but to ourselves. Like, this is what you can do, A, B, C, and D. Or if this is happening, you know, maybe you need to call 911 or you go get friends or you do, you know, there's different things to do in different situations. But we're not, we need to be given those tools, very concrete tools. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask Dana Russell, who has just shared um, some very wise advice on how to uh, deal with these kinds of issues and conversation. Uh, Dana, are you with us? Dana. Okay. I've unmuted Dana, but um, I'm not sure that she's uh, attentive to the computer at the moment. Uh, Dana said, um, I've found that it helps to reject false equivalencies when you can do so safely. So, Beth, what do you think of that remark? Um, to reject false equivalencies. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, I'm, I'm hoping, Dana, are you there? Okay, yeah, Dana is not um, maybe w hooked up to her mic or something. So um, I think she's just referring to um, in conversation when um, somebody makes a claim and uh, you just maybe counter it. Yeah. Count, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I, and I have family members who do this. Um, um, for example, uh, this is a personal story. I've never shared a personal story of, of encountering hate, but a family member of mine was um, very disturbed to hear me watching a TED talk of Malala's father uh, because all he heard was a Pakistani accent. And, you know, unfortunately, this uh, family member of mine hasn't, especially through a lot of conversation with me, um, come to disassociate his ideas of um, Al-Qaeda and terrorism with uh, Middle Eastern and Muslim people. Um, so basically, um, what I did is I just tried to explain, you know, that um, it's not the same thing, that domestic extremism, uh, terrorism is not a religious uh, platform and it's you know unfortunately a small minority and you know he just couldn't get into the mind of accepting what I had to say as fact and kind of got upset and you know it was anger and fear that I heard and like I, on a day-to-day -day basis this is a relative of mine that really has no contact um, with you know diverse diverse situations in America is like an Irish Catholic and so uh, what I tried to do in that situation is just like refute facts um, as best that I could, um, you know, recall instances of people that I personally know and to sort of make a personal connection to say, you know, I work with people who are Muslim and I work with people who are Pakistani and I have become friends with uh, ex extensions of those people that I've met through professional situations and, you know, this is just not the case and right now what we're listening to is a man who's standing up for uh, all women and girls in the Middle East to say, you know, it's our role not to be bystanders in our uh, political scenario, which is sort of discriminating against women. And the reason that you celebrate my daughter is because I didn't clip her wings. So, um, you know, I try to share positive messaging as much as possible. Um, yeah, but I, I that's an, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that that's an excellent strategy. Um, and I, you know, sometimes that is the the best type of response, or with your family member, um, to you know point out the fact that Timothy McVeigh committed horrific terrorism in this country, murdered many people, and he was a white American Christian. Um, that um, you know, and and I hear that a lot, especially um, from from people about Muslims. What you said that all Muslims are terrorists, etc. And it, it's one of the reasons why we do a lot of programming at, at our center on Muslim rescuers, um, to, you know, because it just it shatters so many stereotypes. Where here we have Muslims that are rescuing Jews, and then there are other stories, uh, other events where uh, Jews have supported Muslims. And shattering the stereotypes is, is can be very powerful. Mm. Um, so Dana has actually shared with us that she does not have a mic, but she did explain um, to say, you know, if someone is uh, saying 
something like Alu, Alu Akbar um, is, is a terrible thing to say, it, it means God is great. And you might counter by saying, as a follower of an Abrahamic faith, do you object to praising God? Um, so I like that that idea. Um, I think it's always a good idea, right. just like you did in your presentation, to point out the similarities between us. Um, you know, that's a, one strategy, and um, especially coming from an interfaith platform, mm -hmm. um, where we sort of promote that whether or not you're, you know, a devoutly religious person or someone who's remotely interested in in religion or faith or spirituality, that these are the core tenets that we try to um, share with the world, no matter what tradition that you follow. Right. Exactly. Um, and, you know, putting, you know, the cliche, putting your money where your mouth is, um, it's one, it, one of the things that we uh, do a lot of is collaboration with other religious institutions, with other cultural institutions. We have an incredibly close relationship with the Islamic Center here on Long Island. We're doing a program a few different programs with them and also at the Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, there's a lot of interfaith programs. Not only are we reaching the people that attend, but through the advertising, again, as role models, we're breaking down a lot of barriers. We're showing people the, the neighborliness or the friendliness right. of relationships, professionally and personally, that, that do exist on Long Island. Um, and it really does help in supporting each other and helping to change the culture. And even if it's just a little bit, every little bit counts. You know, and every little bit helps. Oh, I I completely appreciate that point. Um, I am noticing that the clock is running out here, and we're nearing um, the end of the hour. I so, for speaking so much. no, actually, I think that's great. So, you know, sometimes a lot of questions is. Uh, um, a sign that the presentation wasn't clear, and I think I nailed it when I said, you know, your presentation like covered every possible um, facet of this problem from a global scale to a, like a national scale here and a personal to a societal um, frame of reference. So I appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to sharing this. Um, we're going to be sending some more webinar invitations uh, fairly shortly in the next couple of weeks here, and I'm going to go ahead and share Beth's presentation uh, via a YouTube link to everyone who is here who's hoping to be able to watch it again and um, share it. And thank you again, Beth, for being so gracious as to donate your time and expertise uh, to the Fates Against Hate campaign you know, it's so hard after something so recent and so close um, where we can see, you know, how powerful the, the hate problem is in the United States and still so sloppy um, at the same time. I mean, we have now so many incidents of Sikhs being murdered from somebody who hated Muslims and Methodists being murdered by someone who hates the Jewish population. And it doesn't matter. What we learn from that is it doesn't matter. This is a problem that affects all of us. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a believer or non-believer. The, the problem is, is all of ours on all of our shoulders and we just need to stand with each other. Um, so I, I'm thankful again. I just want to ask one last question before we close. Um, if there's one thing that you'd like to see the participants and the, and the viewers later on of the webinar um, do, um, maybe beyond checking out genocidewatch.net, um, looking into maybe programming in their own area, like what is one small, simple thing that they can do? Uh, I think focus, to, to tell yourself that it doesn't have to be overwhelming, to focus on one particular issue or helping <laughs> one particular person, or just the next time you're confronted with some form of hatred intolerance, injustice, to do something and not to, you know, later on say, oh, I wish I had did something, but really to be brave and take that first step. And once you take that first step and do that first, you know, you make that first uh, positive action, you know, the next time that something happens, it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. And it's just breaking our own fear that we are, that we should we should know that we're allowed to help somebody else. We should help somebody else if it's safe for us, and to give yourself permission to do so. Mm. And you become a hero to that person you're helping. You become Superman and Superwoman to that person. Hmm. Thank you so much, Beth. And for the first time, before I close the webinar, I have messages pouring in. Everyone saying thank you, that this was excellent, and they've learned so much. Mm -hmm.
So that's so great validation. So, you know, take that good energy and please pay it forward and come visit the Holocaust Memorial Tolerance Center. Uh, even though they're local in, in Nassau County, as you can see today, that they, they have lessons to share that we all need to hear, no matter where oh, we are. Website. Yeah, oh, so yeah. the website, we're going to share that. It's um, www.holocaust dash nasa.org and then again the parliament hopefully you've all been connected with us but um, we're really trying to engage uh, Facebook um, not so much for the benefit of everyone who's just already learning these lessons but by sharing our discussions um, we can um, expose our friends and our family members to these conversations which maybe it never occurred to them that could uh, happen that they can engage with these kind of topic areas and so and for, for anybody in my geographical area area we are having a Holocaust Memorial Day uh, on Tuesday the 29th and so please contact me for more information and June 22nd we are commemorating the 20th uh, anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, and we'll have a special program with survivors and mm. a Rwandan and a rescuer. So, again, please contact me. I'll give you information. That's fabulous programming. All righty. Well, I just want to thank everyone again um, for the maybe tenth time, but I'm I am that grateful. So, um, we'll be in touch. And uh, thank you again, Beth. Uh, I wish everyone a, a pleasant rest of their Monday. Hopefully, those of us in the United States will get to go. Actually, it's Wednesday. Um, we get to go home soon and have a nice evening. And um, just think about our presentation today and email me. Uh, Molly at parliamentofreligions.org with questions or ideas, suggestions, um, anything you want to share with Beth, I can connect you. So thanks again, Beth, and I wish everyone a fabulous, fabulous day. Molly?